In the light of union frustration after the unsuccessful Peninsula campaign failed to take Richmond, and the Confederacy Seven Days campaign, which repelled the Union Army of the Potomac, the North's military powers that be surrendered something they would regret. The Strategic Initiative. This is the story of what Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia did with it. In a dramatic turnaround in the Eastern Theater, we returned to ground through which ran a stream that locals called Bull Run. This is the story of the Battle of Second Manassas. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. In July of 1862, there was dissension and mistrust within the Union Army of the Potomac. A Massachusetts cavalry officer summed the situation by stating, We have been divided by our leaders. Only a month before, Major General George McClellan's army was only three or four miles outside of Richmond. Then, Robert E. Lee's Seven Days campaign hammered them back to the James River. Despite the fact that Lee's army had suffered some 20,000 casualties in that effort, he was embraced as a deliverer. Simultaneously, some 100 miles to the north, up in Washington City, Abraham Lincoln had to suffer McClellan's frustration. Bombarded by little Mac's incessant requests for reinforcements, the president decided to visit his commander down on the James at Harrison's Landing. On July 7th, the man who retreated from Richmond, who consistently and still believed himself outnumbered, now wanted to take the offensive. The president asked him how he would do so but found that McClellan, other than he wanted more troops, had no concrete plans. Four days after Lincoln's visit, and still harboring doubts about McClellan's command abilities, Lincoln acted. He named Major General Henry Halleck his new general-in-chief, a position that McClellan previously held. And on July 26th, he gave command of a newly created army in Virginia to an officer who had enjoyed success out in the Western Theater, Major General John Pope. Back in April of 1862, Pope, with naval assistance, had captured Island Number 10, which allowed federal navigation down the Mississippi to Tennessee. Mr. Lincoln wanted Pope to be a healer in the troubled Eastern Theater, but sadly, he was not. Tall, tall. Burley, and clearly anti-McClellan, he could be brash. Brigadier General Fitz John Porter, one of McClellan's corps commanders, had recently called Pope an ass. Brigadier General Samuel Sturgis was more colorful. I don't care for John Pope one pinch of owl dung. Undaunted, the new commander announced that he had come from out of the West, where his men had only seen the backs of their enemies. He announced his headquarters would be in the saddle. Confederate leadership commented, that was odd, that's where his hindquarters belonged. When Pope arrived in Virginia, he noted there was a great deal of Confederate guerrilla activity. To counter it, he stated that Virginia citizens would be held accountable for any raids or strikes. Stacked on top of another directive that his army would live off the land, an informed and incensed 52-year-old Robert E. Lee labeled John Pope a miscreant and emphatically stated he ought to be suppressed. Strong words for the man of iron control. For Pope, his newly created Army of Virginia was made up of units that earlier had been turned inside out by Stonewall Jackson during his Shenandoah campaign. Pope's First Corps was under German-American Major General Franz Siegel, and his second was commanded by the former Speaker of the House, Major General Nathaniel Banks. Both had been roughly handled in the valley by Jackson. 
Things did not improve with the head of Pope's Third Corps, for Major General Irvin McDowell seemed star-crossed. After his defeat at first Bull Run, his men believed him a jinx. Both Federal and Confederate armies ridiculed his distinctive hat a pith hat or helmet, which he wore to protect him from the sun. His own soldiers thought it a signal to the enemy, and Confederates simply thought, as one put it, that it looked like an inverted washbowl. So despised he was in the Federal ranks that when word spread that he was thrown from his mount, soldiers gave three cheers for the horse. Siegel Banks and McDowell did not inspire confidence, and that was exactly what Confederate authorities in Richmond had in Lee, who learned on July 12th that Banks' corps had been ordered to Gordonsville, Virginia, where the Orange and Alexandria Railroad intersected with the Virginia Central. Fully aware that McClellan's army was still down on the James at Harrison's Landing, Yet concerned about Banks' movements, Lee ordered Jackson to ascertain Federal intent. On July 27th, with still no sign of stirring by the Army of the Potomac, Lee ordered A.P. Hill's Light Division to join Jackson. The strategic chessboard sprang to life. Then on the 3rd of August, Lee learned that Major General Ambrose Burnside and his 14,000 men had been ordered to join Pope in central Virginia. The Confederate chieftain wanted Jackson to engage the Federal force before Burnside's arrival. On that same day, Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton disengaged one of their own. They pulled the plug on McClellan's desire to return to Richmond. They did so in part because he repeatedly reported he was outnumbered. With intel that Confederates were on the move, McClellan's paranoia seemed to spread to Washington City. Why keep two federal armies separated, Pope in central Virginia and McClellan down on the James, if Lee has overwhelming numbers? And so, Lincoln and Stanton wanted the two armies to unite, and to do so in central Virginia, not on the James, and certainly not under the command of George McClellan. The next day, the Army of the Potomac was ordered off the peninsula. When that information reached Lee, it gave him something no federal leader wanted him to have. Robert E. Lee now had the strategic initiative. Meanwhile, Stonewall Jackson continued to probe, and with units of Pope's army spread out over some 20 miles, an encounter was unavoidable. And it came around noon of August the 9th, at a place known as Cedar Mountain. There, Nathaniel Banks' 9,000 and Jackson's 24,000 collided. For most of that Saturday afternoon, they traded artillery fire. Then around 5 p.m., Banks, though outnumbered, ordered his men forward. Surprisingly, their attack overlapped Jackson's left and caved in three Confederate lines. Just as surprising, soon, too, Jackson's right was threatened as well. The situation so dire that Jackson himself rode forward into the fray. To rally his men, he reached to draw his sword, only to find the blade and scabbard so rusted he couldn't wield it. Instead, back he raced to the rear and found Major General A.P. Hill and Brigadier General Lawrence O'Brien Branch, who with his brigade of North Carolinians met, stemmed, and turned back Federal attacks. Their work saved Jackson from a very embarrassing setback. Banks withdrew around 6.30, and Jackson pursued but without effect. The scrap at Cedar Mountain was badly mismanaged by both Jackson and Banks. There were 2,377 Union casualties, 1,355 Confederate. So confused was the fight that both sides claimed victory. However, Banks' fight and losses seemed to take some of the sting and bluster out of John Pope's aggressiveness. Meanwhile, Lee received more intelligence. McClellan's army was not only leaving the peninsula, but his men were ordered to join Pope. A concern Lee now realized that Pope's force could possibly swell to some 130,000. He had to move, 
He had to strike Pope before federal concentration. And so he ordered his other wing under James Longstreet to move. It was very risky, for by ordering Longstreet's men to march, Richmond would be defended by only some 25,000 men. Oh, the what might have beens. For that very same day, McClellan made one last plea to allow his army to return to Richmond. But Washington had had enough. Bring your army north and send units to Pope's Army of Virginia. In the central part of the Old Dominion, Pope's, at that moment, 62,000-man army was in an angle formed by the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers. His lifeline for supply the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. In need of good fortune, he got some, interestingly enough, from Confederate cavalryman Jeb Stewart. After conferring with Lee on August the 18th, Stewart rode to a house near Verdiersville to rendezvous with one of his lieutenants. Leaving his cloak, sash, gloves, and plumed hat on the porch, Stewart went inside to sleep. The next morning, using the cover of an early morning mist, Union cavalry descended upon them. Stuart escaped, but his pride took a hit, for the Federals captured his gear, which included his plumed hat, and a haversack that contained Lee's plans to entrap Pope's force between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock. With this information, Pope moved north of the Rappahannock and out of immediate danger. Stuart was justifiably miffed by Pope's retreat, and Confederate infantry made it worse when they constantly inquired of him, Where's your hat? Angry and embarrassed, Stuart burned to get even, and it came August the 22nd in a raid at Catlett Station on the Orange in Alexandria. At dawn that day, 1,500 Confederates overran a Union cap. There, a captured African-American servant revealed that he knew the exact location of Pope's personal baggage train. To the Confederate cavalier seeking one upmanship, the opportunity was too tempting. Moving 60 miles in 26 hours, his men cut the telegraph line, descended on Catlett Station, and scattered the Federals. They not only captured $500,000 in greenbacks, 20000 in gold, 300 prisoners, official papers, and Pope's staff, but also Pope's dress uniform. In addition, they captured one federal captain who had wagered with a Confederate prisoner that he would be in Richmond within 30 days. He won the bet. He did enter Richmond within 30 days but as a prisoner of war. A plea Stewart took the raid and his acquisitions to another level. He sent a note to Pope that read, General, you have my hat and plume. I have your best coat. I have the honor to propose a cartel for a fair exchange of prisoners. There was more here than just showmanship. Captured papers informed Lee that McClellan's 3rd Corps had landed at Alexandria, Virginia, and Porter's 5th Corps had landed at Aquia Creek, and both were headed for Pope. Lee feared Pope's army would soon grow to 70,000. There is a military maxim, never divide your army in the face of superior numbers. Yet, that is exactly what Lee did. On the 24th of August, orders were sent to Stonewall to move his 24,000 westward and circle around Pope's force to the north. Anxious to make up for his dismal performance during the seven days and at Cedar Mountain, Jackson commented, I shall move within an hour. Longstreet's 30,000 were to hold Pope's army in place by demonstrating in front of him, then follow Jackson the next day. Lee hoped that his opponent, fearing encirclement, would retreat, and his reunited army would then fall upon an off-balanced federal force. However, by 8 a.m. of the next day, Pope was aware of the Confederate move, but he misread the intent. Pope believed Jackson, moving west, was headed for the Shenandoah Valley, but at Salem, Virginia, Jackson turned his army east and made his way to Thoroughfare Gap, which passed through the Bull Run Mountains. 
About mid-morning of the 26th, Stonewall Jackson turned toward Gainesville, Virginia, and then southeast to Bristow Station. His foot cavalry had covered 56 miles in two days, and it was now a full 20 miles in John Pope's rear. At Bristow Station, Brigadier General Isaac Trimble's 21st Georgia and 21st North Carolina were given a special task. Jackson ordered them to move four miles north to Manassas Junction, where they fell upon Pope's lightly guarded supply depot, one that covered nearly a square mile. Scattering a New Jersey brigade, the 221s, on the 27th of August wreaked havoc. Yet, as we all know, battle is fluid, and this fact was dramatically reinforced when one of Jackson's lieutenants, Major General Richard S. Ewell, reported a large federal force moving up from the south. It was Pope, and Jackson had to pull his force together and did so seven miles away at a place known as Stony Ridge. In doing so, each of Jackson's three divisions used three different routes. All this was reported to Pope. Stung with anger over the loss of his supplies and trains, and now dealing with reports of Confederate activity that seemed to be all over the countryside, he too wanted to unite his scattered units. In doing so, he was convinced that a worried Jackson would make a run west for the valley. Around 9 a.m. of Wednesday, August 27th, Pope ordered his army to unite at Manassas Junction. There, he was certain he would box in an isolated Jackson. So confident he crowed, we shall bag the whole crowd. His orders, however, had an unfortunate consequence. By concentrating at Manassas Junction, Pope essentially uncovered Thoroughfare Gap, the very route Lee and Longstreet planned to use to join Jackson. Now all the scattered routes that Jackson's divisions used came into play. Made aware on the 28th that A.P. Hill's Confederate force was spotted in Centerville, Pope issued new orders. His force would now gather at Centerville. As he issued these orders, 30,000 Confederates were headed for Thoroughfare Gap, and only one Union division, Brigadier James Ricketts, stood in their way. Only one Union division to stop five. Confederate numbers were simply too great. As Lee and Longstreet pushed their way through, Brigadier General Rufus King's Federal Division, that day under Brigadier General John Hatch because King was down after suffering an epileptic seizure, was stretched out in column along the Warrington Turnpike, and while searching for Jackson, marched right in front of Stonewall's men at Stony Point. They were probing for Jackson, but it was Jackson who found them. At about 6 p.m. on Thursday, August the 28th, just off to the left of the turnpike, a lone horseman appeared from the cover of the woods. It was none other than Jackson, and although he should have waited for the arrival of Longstreet's wing, he could not resist the sight of the enemy stretched out in column before him. Jackson slipped back into the woods and calmly ordered, "'Bring up your men, gentlemen.'" Amongst that unsuspecting Union division, there was a savvy veteran, Brigadier General John Gibbon, who commanded 2,100 men, all of them from the West, the 2nd, 6th, 7th Wisconsin, and the 19th Indiana, the famed Black Hat or Iron Brigade. Gibbon, appointed to West Point from, interestingly enough, North Carolina, had three brothers, two brothers-in-law, and a cousin who wore gray. Gibbon saw the lone horseman and watched him disappear. He also saw several columns of horsemen. He thought they might be roving cavalry, but then they did something that set off his military alarm. All began to swing left in unison. Instantaneously, he recognized the maneuver of swinging guns into battery. There, in front of John Brawner's farm, Gibbon's Iron Brigade was about to be hit by six brigades of Jackson's veterans. The Battle of Brawner's Farm, or Groveton, the first chapter in the Battle of Second Manassas began.
Thank you.